Do you like books? I mean, really, really like books? Then you're in the right place. Each week, your host, Sam Hankin, interviews the best of today's top-selling authors and the up-and-coming superstars of modern literature. This is The Avid Reader. Here is your host, Sam Hankin. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another edition of The Avid Reader, brought to you by Wellington Square Bookshop. Our guest today is Lawrence Lemer, author of Capote's Women, a true story of love, betrayal, and a swan song for an era published by Penguin and released last month. Lawrence has published so many books. Let me give you a thumbnail sketch. All of them bestsellers. His first was Make Believe, The Life of Nancy and Ronald Reagan. I really like King of the Night, which is the life of Johnny Carson, since I spent most, most of my childhood and uh, early adulthood watching that show. And remember uh, Truman Capote on that many, many times. I also like the biography of uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger. His most popular work, I guess, is his trilogy on the Kennedys. The Kennedys, the Kennedy women, who figure in this book as well. Um, the Kennedy men and sons of Camelot. Capote's women chronicles a, a name, a time um, when, when he was at least a household word for a certain socioeconomic demographic. It has faded to a certain extent, but Breakfast at Tiffany's and In Cold Blood still resonate in our culture and our media. While Capote's life is interwoven throughout the book, as its title suggests, it deals with his swans, those women born to be rich, that he befriended and almost seduced in a kind of way, and who he eventually perhaps betrayed in kind of his life's work, a Proustian attempt at chronicling a time and a place and the inhabitants of it. Answered prayers or what we have of it is that betrayal of those women who then primarily abandoned their friend such as he was then and left him kind of to wallow in drugs and alcohol until he succumbed to both of those vices and his untimely death. Babe, Diana, Slim, Pamela, Gloria, Morella, and CZ, perhaps his best friend, maybe at the end his only friend, Along the way, in and out saunter, Hawks, Hemingway, Cooper, Grant, McCall, I could go on and on, Churchill, Hepburn, um, even Harper Lee and Gore Vidal and Norman Mailer, Andy Warhol. All in all, a side down memory lane for those of us old enough to have experienced and remember the, this, and those who will be fascinated at the time, the glamour and the wealth, maybe learning for the first time of mid-century American culture. Welcome, Lawrence. Thank you for having me. You know, I remember as a kid watching The Tonight Show and being fascinated by the appearances of Truman and the way in which Carson seemed to admire and respect at the same time making fun of him a little bit. And I wondered about that. And you do an admirable job of talking about the impact that Capote made with his appearance before different people in different classes. Um, maybe maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Well, for, in the first place, Truman and Johnny Carson were neighbors. They lived together in the UN, Pla UN Plaza, and that's where Johnny's w second wife, Joanne Carson, became one of Truman's closest friends. So, so Johnny had that relation to him. And jo Johnny uh, lasted so long on television, the way nobody's ever going to last out long in popular media again, because he understood American culture, and he pushed things just as far as he could push them. And having a gay man on television in that era, that was pushing things. When Truman grew up, if you were gay in most of the United States, you could be arrested. I had a friend who was an officer in the Navy in World War II in the Pacific. His job was to find gays and put them in jail. So that, that's kind of the, the, the life that Truman had. And he came in this flamboyantly gay out guy when nobody was out, okay? And, and he was out on television. And he was bold on television. And he, and he announced his, his sexual preferences to the whole world. You know, it's funny uh, thinking about the way he dressed. Oh, you know, you talk about how in certain contexts, he was admitted, and especially with the women who, as I said earlier, he kind of, they were drawn to him. The men weren't threatened because of his sexuality. But talk about like if he went to, like when he went to visit in cold blood and they see him walking along in this scarf that drags the ground, like as you said, is a is a Dora Duncan's uh, tragic last outfit. 
Well, they had never seen anything so strange in their life. I mean, these Midwesterners, when I worked for three months in 1962 with What's Your Iowa Patriot Chronicle, a town of 1,000 in Iowa. And believe me, they would, they'd never seen, they would, in Nebraska, they never saw anybody like this. This little guy, he's coming in, he's got the scarf down and this accent, this bizarre accent. What is that? How is he going to do journalism? How is he going to interview these people? They, they just uh, were, were intimidated by him. Well, if we go back, we'll, we'll, we'll investigate the swans. Uh, one, why did he call them that? Why did he say they might not be rich, but they're born to be rich? Why was he attracted to them? And then primarily, since the book's about it, why were they attracted to him? Well, you know, some people can't understand why you can write a, a, a masterpiece about rich people. They're kind of, kind of a disdainful attitude toward the rich. Well, that didn't stop Edith Wharton from writing her masterpieces about the Gilded Age and upper class then, uh, or, 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 or many other you know, great, great authors. So that's what Truman attempted to do. Coming from a, coming from a poor boy from a little town in, in, in Alabama, that's doubly fascinating. And he, was, he, had this profound, he had this artistic sense. He loved beautiful things. And it wasn't just the women, it was, it was their homes, it was the artwork, it was the fashion, it was the decor, everything about the li their lives, he loved that beauty. I guess the first time he encountered that attitude towards wealth may have been with the person he had the most conflicted relationship with, which was his mother. Talk exactly. A bit about exactly. He had a tortured relationship with her. His mom, his mother, who was the first person he met that was aspiring towards moving up. And yet their relationship was fraught with all kinds of angst. And then he wrote about her a lot and he drew from her. Do you think that relationship affected the whole thing? Oh yeah. I mean, so many of my, my I'm not gay, but so many of my gay friends, when you start talking about, talk their, about their mothers, they have very complicated relations with, with their mothers, right? And Truman certainly that he had a love hate relationship with her. She, she kind of she kind of pretty much abandoned him. She disdained him for being gay. She tried to quote unquote cure him, right? To do to send him to a shrink or whatever, and uh, she put him down endlessly. And yet she was beautiful, and he loved beauty, and he loved to be with to be with her for that. In the end, so she aspired to be part of the elite. Her, her husband, who was an accountant, ended up stealing $100,000 in those years, it's like a million dollars now, and uh, to have the money so they could be, car, be, car, be part of this cafe society, which you bought your way into. And he was arrested and spent a year in Sing Sing. That was all to be part of this, this ersatz elite. Okay, if we talk about the elite, then I don't, it, it's, it's gonna be hard if we talk about everybody, but why don't we talk about first, maybe Babe, and who she was. It's a good template for the rest of them. Who she was, what she wanted, how she obtained it, and actually how she obtained it over and over again. Well, she was one of the fabulous three Cushing sisters, which mother said, and the father was a famous, one of the great doctors of the of the early early 20th century. But, and she wanted her three daughters to marry the rich, some of the richest men in the world. And that's exactly what they did. And Babe's second husband was, was Wilma Paley, the founder of CBS. And uh, Babe, when she was 17 years old, was in a traffic accident. Her face had to re be remade. She lost her teeth. She, she had false teeth from that. And she, she slept in a different room from her husband. And uh, she, when she got up in the morning, she put in her teeth, she put on her makeup, put on her dress. Only then would she open the door and go and meet, meet her husband. Her, her life was a facade from the, from the minute she got up. But she was one of the, considered one of the most beautiful women in the world. And the cover of Capote's women, there she is. Incredible photo of her. But look carefully. And there's sadness in her face. Truman said that she tried to commit suicide twice. That's certainly possible. Hey, do you have the book? Her, her, her yeah, husband was so but... disdainful. Pardon? You had the book in front of you, so since I own a bookstore, it'd be great if you could show the cover to our potential sure. readers. Sure, definitely. Happy to do that. Because it's a great cover. Yeah. And, and just can you see the sadness there, the sadness in her face? Hold it up a little higher. Yeah, there, there you go. Yeah. Uh, and um, uh, like I always say, every interview, 
Uh, everybody who comes into my store judges a book by its cover, and that's a great one. And yeah, exactly. Exactly. Isn't that you don't judge a book by a cover? Well, yeah, judge it by its cover, right? Yeah. And that's why the publishers generally, since they want to sell books, generally are the ones that either, did you get a chance to vet it? Did you get a chance? To, did you design it? No, no, but it, I remembered something totally different. The biggest hit I ever had was the Kennedy Women, 25 years ago. And when 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 it was been when when they chose in the cover, they chose a cover. It was artwork. Okay, Barnes and Noble didn't like that cover. Barnes and Noble wanted a different cover. I'm thinking, what the hell does Barnes and Noble have to do with the cover of my book? Well, they vetoed it because because they were the biggest buyer and they wanted a different cover. And I guess they made the right judgment since it was number two New York, New York Times bestseller. Yeah, I always think about that. Covers and epigraphs. Right. Um, so this idea of wealth, oh, you know what was interesting? Each of these women primarily had, and each of the men had affairs, sequ sequential mates. The children they had were almost extraneous to their lifetimes. Right. They knew each other. That culture, even their beauty then might not be considered as beautiful now. That whole lifestyle, do you think uh, I understand? I, I can't. I can't say that I understand it, but I remember it all. Do you think that lifestyle and that look would resonate today with you know a younger demographic? It's gone. It's gone. It's gone. It lasts for one generation. Women would not. Women don't have the time. They're more serious. They're they're professional, right? I mean, uh, goodness. I, I went to the National Symphony Saturday evening. And the majority of that, are, that orchestra is women. I mean, it's just like a stunning way this country is changing. The majority of college students are women. The, 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 the majority of law students are women. Do they have the time to sit around for hours and, 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 and worry, about, worry about the design addresses? No, it's a different world. Do you think, not to put you on the spot, can you think of any woman now who kind of fills that role? I mean, I could name celebrities, but it's not the same thing. No, but what they do now is is everything is monetized. Okay, so I mean, I mean, Paley was a brilliant entrepreneur. If he had married to Babe now, he'd have Babe Paley dresses, Babe Paley perfume. He'd make a lot of money off his wife. But that that wasn't done then. Oh, the other thing that is kind. Of, oh, well, the Met Gala this year, um, and um, Truman's white, uh, black and white ball. And you know, Dominic Dunn in that book, uh, The Way We Were Then also had a black and white ball, I think. But, yes, he did, right, yeah. So, yeah, Dominic's a friend of mine. Really? Yeah. I love that book because again, the pictures showed happiness. You could see through them like with, um, I don't know, who's the guy? Who's the guy's, per oh, who's the guy that was perpetually tanned? Uh, Hamilton, who was Yeah, that? Hamilton, George Hamilton. Yeah. He looked, like was, he looked like he was in a spit. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and you could see you could see Anthony Perkins and their faces weren't, and you talk about this, how the money never, not, does not necessarily, I read somewhere that the two unhappiest types of people in the world are those that have too little money and those who have too much. Well, those who have too little don't have time to think about it. Those who have too much, that's all they think about. In fact, is, is there any greater pleasure in life than reading a book about people who have more money than you do and are unhappy? So I think, I think in your bookstore, you should have a special section for those books. You know, people who are unhappy with their lives and middle class lives, or well, read these rich folks, they, they're, they're not happy. I, one of my closest friends was a man called, called Maker, Mako Stewart. He was a steward of land title company because he had a lot of money. And he was, he was very unhappy with his money. He said, the money has brought me nothing but unhappiness. It's made, I'm just unhappy. I'm an inheritor. I'm just, it's just devastating. I said, Mako, I feel sorry for you. I will take your money. And he didn't want me to do that. Yeah, and it's it's not understood. I remember when I was younger and I had these friends and I would tell my father, this guy has a boat, this guy has a plane, he's got all this. And my father says, all it takes is money. And it took me like 20 years of therapy to realize what he was saying. <laughs> exactly. After the, Mad the Madoff scandal in Palm Beach, it was a cocktail party and these women were sitting around talking with him. This one woman said, oh my goodness, I, I, I invested all my money in with, uh, with, with Madoff. And then we said, well, how much did you invest? I missed $10 million. 
and I lost everything. And the other woman said, yeah, but what about the rest of your money? <laughs> yeah, that's very true. I'm only in the bottom of the 1%, right. some percent. Right. right. I kind of wish that I had lived in those times, but then I don't, I, maybe I don't. Do you ever think about that? You, well, you, were, you and I were both kind of through that time. Well, I wasn't in that league, I must say. But uh, yeah, it, it would have been fascinating. I, I kind of admired some certain qualities in this woman. I mean, this book has gotten the best reviews of my life so far. Not only is it not a negative review, but there's not there, there's always one negative sentence in a review, right? The, the reviewer has he's got to prove his integrity by saying something nasty about your book, but uh, not in not not in these reviews. So uh, uh, you know. I don't, know, I don't know where that was leading me to. It's a totally different story. But I remember doing a uh, talk in Pittsburgh years ago. And the other author, he'd been the publisher in chief of, of the Boston Publishing House. And he, then he became a popular novelist. And afterwards, we went out for a drink. And I asked him, what is the difference between being an editor in chief and being a popular novelist? The difference is this, he said, when I was an editor, I'd read a review, and I'd find the one good line and put it in the ads. As an author, I read that same review and I find the one bad line and I remember it for life. I'm, I live the same way. <laughs> um, it's interesting because when I actually, when I first picked up the book, I thought it might be just a linear progression of Truman's life. And in fact, although, as I said, Truman is interwoven throughout yeah, the book. Yeah. The book is really about these women. And that's what's so fascinating. And sometimes like, I'll read a book where the chapter, each chapter is a different person. And I go, oh, I don't want to read about a different person because I like the last person so right, much. Right. It was different here because each one was, again, so different from the last. But at the end, they all, or most of them, were friends with each other, which was also paradoxical to me. Exactly, exactly. Well, in that league, it's, it's total aside. Remember years ago, I had a friend who knew Norman Mailer. And she was invited to a party at his home in, in Brooklyn. And she asked if I could go be her escort. Well, my, bu figuring my busy social life, I arranged it so I could go. And I was in New York and she took the train up and had this leather bag, which I grabbed. And we took the subway over to Brooklyn. You know, all these limos are lined up on the street and it's a five-story walk up. And we walk up there and there are everybody famous in America is there. I mean, Gorby Dahl is there. Uh, uh, Jackie is there. You wouldn't believe it. Well, I'm, I, I go around the room and I want to listen to what these people are saying, thinking they're having these fascinating conversations. They aren't. They're talking about the last business deals or this or that, boring, boring conversations like any cocktail party. And they were there, not because they knew Norman, but because they were celebrities and he was celebrities. So it came time to leave the party. They didn't say goodbye to Norman. They just walked down the stairs because they didn't know him. Well, I'm this kid from upstate New York, basically. And I, I was taught that when you, you, you thank the host, even though I wasn't invited. So I have this leather, I have this leather thing on my shoulder. And I go up to him and I say, Mr. Miller, thank you for having me. And he says, thank you. You did a good job. I'll hire you next time. He thought I was one of the waiters. <laughs> I remember, you know, the feud between Gore and Norman Mailer, and then the feud between Truman and Gore Vidal, and I remember watching those on TV, and I loved them. They they were so funny, and Norman yeah. Mailer always threatening to get right. into a boxing match with them. No, exactly. And it's funny with Norman. You mentioned Norman Mailer at that party. It was the, it was when it was when Truman when Norman was in his fighting stage. Okay, and uh, he, he was so desperate to have a fight that day that evening. He had a fight with his accountant. Okay, and he put up their fists and they start fighting like this. And I looked at him and I said, I said, I thought about Norman, you're a big fraud. You, you're this sensitive Jewish kid and you don't know how to fight. You put your fist. I mean, I had a fight with when my college girlfriend broke up and broke up with me for Artie Frankel. I had a fight with Artie Frankel. And that's the way I fought. OK, we couldn't do any harm. And Norman couldn't do any harm either. He had that pugilistic face. That he, wanted, was he wanted to be this macho guy, don't we all? Yeah, which brings me to what I was saying at the beginning about, like I said, Truman's life interwoven and then the, the women, and then you interweave, because it was the truth, all the people they came across, all the people they know. Um, and like I said, it was just so many of them. And yeah, yeah Hawks, 
Hemingway, Cooper, Lauren Bacall, yeah. who, whose career was started uh, because of right. one of uh, one of his uh, yeah, Slim Keith. Yeah, Slim, Slim Keith's picture in Vogue. Yeah, tell no, that it's, it's, tell that story in a little more detail because it was fascinating. I had no idea. Well, Slim Keith was this gorgeous, the classic California girl, basically the first California girl, right? But featured in all these magazines in 1945, and she saw in Vogue this uh, this young woman that she thought would be perfect for Howard Hawks, her husband, who, was the, who, who then was the, the greatest director in Hollywood, the most successful director for a movie called To Have and To Have Not. And so they flew her to California and she had the starring role alongside Humphrey Bogart. And Hawks t tended to sleep with the women in his movies. And he was very distressed because she slept with Humphrey Bogart instead and married him. Oh, yeah, yeah. I remember that from the book. What about, um, who was it that had the, uh, not semi-platonic, but the platonic relationship with Hemingway? And they were always going to Cuba or Key West. Uh, that was Slim Keith again. Slim Keith would go, because, because, because her husband, Howard Ox, was making a movie with Hemingway. So she, so she went, she went to Cuba to to try to get somebody to. They were having trouble with the screenplay, and he was, she was to go there to see if they could fix it. Well, she fixed it by having an affair with the screenwriter. These, you know, who needs she a sexual, kind of who needs a sexual revolution? I mean, who needs it? These guys, what, could you have any more sex than they were having? I don't think so. No, and that was amazing to me, and the fact that each spouse, in many cases, just kind of accepted it. They didn't want it right out there, but they knew about it. And yeah. And the other thing was the superficial aspect of their own love and sexuality. And then again, as I said in the introduction, the fact that they seem to ignore their children, which at first yeah. I thought was horrible, but then it happened time after time. Okay, two things. Uh, first of all, I find the, 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 the lives of the rich kind of absurd in, one, in cer certain ways. One, if I had all that money, would I, why would I want to sleep with my wife? Wouldn't I want to sleep in the bed with her? Why would I get rich? Does she have to sleep in a different bed? I don't get that. And, 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 and if I'm rich, gosh, I want to enjoy my kids. These people just shuttle the kids up and have nothing to do with them. I mean, what, it's just ridiculous as far as I'm concerned. They, they, you go to a dinner party and they come in and the kids curtsy and say hello and off they go with the nanny. Yeah. And the one woman who didn't, and I don't know why she was a swan, who didn't have the beauty was Pamela, but right. was just promiscuous. And, right. and that's how she chose her mates. Right. And you know what, she, I, don't even, her. I don't think even she like, didn't, didn't even like sex. I, I doubt if most of these women like sex. It was just something you did to get your way. Yeah. Well, Pamela was in that category. Well, it's funny then. Who's she, who she going to sleep with? She's going to she, she's going to case the room in five seconds. Look, my my wife loves loves clothes. Okay, she, she she'll go into one of these parties in Palm Beach. She'll look across the room. She'll 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 go down from their hat to their gloves to their shoes. Know exactly how much money they have in their body. She's like, that's thirty seven thousand dollars. What's twenty five thousand? It. it Pamela did this with men. She walks in a room, and she spots the rich guy. That's what she wants. It's look, look it's like in, in Breakfast at Tiffany's. What does Holly go lightly want? She wants a rich man. And in, 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 the, in, the in the end of the novella, not like the ridiculous movie uh, that, that was just the Hollywood romanticization of it. At the, at the end of the novella, she gets in trouble with his businessman she's involved with, and she has to leave the country. And what does she want? She's, she's, she's taking a plane to Rio. Does she want a list of Portuguese phrases? No. She wants a list of the 50 men, richest men in Brazil. Yeah, and the movie had, you know, you criticize the movie, but it pretty much had to do what it did back then, because it had to have a happy ending, right? Yeah, but it's just kind of, American, American audience expected that. I mean, in, in, in that era, you knew what a European film was. A European film didn't have that happy ending, right? And an American film did, because that's what the audience yeah. insisted on. When they went to the Bijou Friday evening, they didn't want to come out feeling sad. That was the other thing that... Uh... I never understood what it was, and I still don't, because you talk about it, it 
Truman would engage all kinds of people with these stories and like almost like a Svengali kind of, you couldn't get away from his stories because they were so good. But of course they were also peppered with lies and gossip. But I don't know, what well, did he say that, that was fascinating? Well, he just had that way of it, it, this insinuating way. I mean, he, he would lean forward and you would lean forward and he would half whisper these stories you would read nobody else. You wouldn't read in the gossip columns. They wouldn't dare say these things. But imagine his situation because he had to, uh, he had to perform. He knew that he was a gay man and he could be tossed out in a minute. He absolutely got that. So he was under great pressure. And, and after a while, it wasn't amusing to, to be amusing. What do you what do you mean? You, you you go to a party, you're invited because you're the performer. You're invited because you have to tell your stories. And you can't you can't just sit there and be quiet. Come on, Truman, tell your stories. Sometimes he wanted to do it like be the center of attention, but not always. Well, there was a certain aspect. Well, I guess Andy Warhol respected him in the way Andy Warhol respected people, and he was almost Warholian in his style, except he wasn't photographing everybody, but it was, he was observing everything. And that was the start of his downfall as well. No, 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 no. One of the reasons he was a great writer. I mean, I mean look, writers have to be observant. They have to be more observant than the average person, right? Wherever they go. And Truman was the ultimate example of that. I mean, he, he uh, uh, went to Russia with a with a, with the first company, a company poor green best the first the first time American performers had, had, had appeared in the Soviet Union, and he, he, and he wrote a piece for the New Yorker, and the detailed observe, observations are just staggering. Nobody else would have seen what he saw and how he saw it. That, that, that's what he was, but it was a painful sensitivity. You, you, you couldn't let it up. You, you always was observing. You'd be at these dinner parties telling your stories, but at the same time, he was seeing everything that was going on and, and gathering as, as possible material for another book. Yeah, and you talk about that, um, the fact that he didn't take notes, especially in the context of Cold Blood and the interviews, that he simply was, as he said, able to remember verbatim, essentially, 90% of what he heard, which is such a great characteristic to have. Well, would I love to have that? No, he had that. Yeah, and it's funny because if you take like the book Ulysses by James Joyce, you know, in the Nighttown episode, basically all it is is at a bar listening to people talk. And I found when I write from time to time, if you're sitting someplace and you listen, it's very interesting. It's, it, it's people listening to people talk, unlike at the cocktail party, is right. very interesting. They say things that, you know, uh, my child is autistic and this is how he, this is what he does in the basement, and things like that, that you wouldn't expect them to be saying. No, but beyond that, when I read a book, I generally can tell whether the author has recorded these interviews or just remembered it. Okay. Uh, I mean, I mean, obviously, it's better to record it. You get, you, you get the real tone of a person's speech. When you remember, you don't. It gets kind of homogenized. Well, I guess that goes to, to the idea of his statement. I don't know what that is. His statement that he was in cold blood, I may be for the first time, he was writing a nonfiction novel. Well, that, that those have been done before. I mean, uh, The Masses was a kind of communist line magazine of the 30s, and they had what we not I mean nonfiction narrative narrative as well in that time and there, there are other examples of it I mean uh, some of the Hiroshima the, the uh, famous uh, yeah uh, was that but he he expanded it and alas he, he, he became a genre a true crime genre okay which is just a cliche if, if you watch the movie in Cold Blood now, which was considered a masterpiece when it came out, right? Now, it, it, it's just like another episode of Law and Order. It's not special. Yeah, I know. I thought about that. I chose CSI, but I, I, okay. I thought it could be the same thing. Right. It's funny, though. Yeah, I mean, no one really... I knew a little bit about it, but I didn't realize, one... Uh, 
how he manipulated the situation, and two, his relationship with Perry, and three, his desire that the execution take place as quickly as possible and his disappointment at various delays. Well, I mean, that's, uh, an author has no loyalty ultimately, but to his truth. It's a scary thing. And, and that's, that's what Truman just cared about. He was friendly at a point, Perry had to die for, for Truman to have his masterpiece. And he, and he pretended he was close to him, pretended he cared and didn't want him to die. He had to die as, as Truman saw it. Well, I guess but that give him credit. Go ahead. Give him credit in that he didn't have a liberal take on this that, and I'm a liberal, but anyway, he didn't have a liberal take on it that, that poor, poor, poor Perry, because of his childhood, did this terrible thing. No, he, he, uh, he saw real evil in the world and the evil in this man. He, he, he loved him. He loved him. He may have loved him physically, but he saw there was evil there. I guess that leads to, I guess, the conclusion of the book and what I understood happened was that when he wrote what he thought was going to be his masterpiece, which took forever and was never finished, his idea was to take these women and to make them his legacy. And then when someone asked him, well, they're going to know you're doing that. And he goes, no, they're too dumb after all this time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and I use that in the book. But, but, but that was the dumb thing, right? To, to think yeah. they would, uh, it, it makes no sense that he would think that. It was a kind of unbelievable arrogance. Yeah, well, so did he feel deep down that, okay, I can sacrifice these women because this book is going to be such a masterpiece that it's going to make my name for history? No, I, I quote in the book what he said about Tennessee Williams in the answered prayers about how he's this friendless little guy. And that, that was Truman, actually. He didn't have any friends because, because he's just concerned about himself in his, in his own career and his writing and his legacy. Yeah, and uh, I, I guess like Tennessee Williams, he, well, like in the, the Glass Menagerie, when I read it, I thought, I wonder if Tennessee Williams knew somebody or some family that was like that and that was the way i felt about truman until i read your book i wasn't right. quite sure yeah exactly uh, especially like with holly holly golightly who right. she model was her well she's the first swan yeah she she she, she is the first she, she and, and she shows her discontent with the woman's place in the world at that time and uh, betty friedan said until until her book uh, nobody, nobody did that. Nobody saw that. But Truman had seen that in, in, in Holly Go Lightly. She was discontent. She was a discontent woman. I, in 19, when, I, when I was working on the Watch Your Iowa Patriot Chronicle in 1962, the young men in high school wore blue jeans and t-shirts, and they wanted to become farmers like, like their fathers. The young women, they were discontent. They went to J.C. Penney's in Sioux City, and, and J.C. Penney's was a very important institution at that time. They knocked off the designer dresses, so these young women could buy these designer dresses for ten or eleven bucks. They wore them. Wore them. That was the measure of their discontent. They were making a political statement without making it. They didn't want to be farmers' wives. Yeah, yeah, it was very much like Betty Friedan. It's interesting that answered prayers is basically from that quote that, well, you know the quote, why don't you say it? Uh, there, there's more unhappiness from answered prayers than unanswered prayers. Which goes to what you were saying about the unhappiness of the rich. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So at the very end, and, and to end our talk, I guess today, who was his only friend? I mean, who, ev did everybody abandon him except CZ? Was everyone gone? No, he, he had some people that stayed with him. I mean, Joanne Carson stayed with him. And the book ends with, uh, I, I, the one mistake I made in the book is I don't like the first person. I don't like to be there, okay? I'm, I'm, I'm not, somebody always likes to be on the edge and watching. So 
I was there in the last chapter with Joanne Carson and these ashes and, and dealing. I was there for every moment of that, but you don't know it in reading the book. You read it if you, if you read the end notes, but I was there for all of that. Oh, tell the story of the ashes. Well, okay. So, 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 well, I got to, got to tell the story of Joanne. Jo Joanne was this, Truman died in Joanne's arm. And Joanne said at that point, first of all, that, uh, that, the, the, the manuscript for answered prayers what had, had Truman had put it in, in, a, in a in a locker somewhere and she had a key but she didn't know where the key for the locker was okay which 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 is I'll tell as you'll see later she made it up she also said that Truman said half of the ashes she was to keep and half was to go to, to Truman's lover longtime lover in New, in New York I, she made that up too so this is in 1984 and uh in, uh, in 1988, I was writing my book about Johnny Carson and Joanne called me one day and she said, shortly before Truman died, he did this tape recording for me, telling me how I could do the 80s counterpart at the black and white ball in Los Angeles. And uh, I'm gonna do it Hall Halloween. Well, she, she, I'm sure she made that up too. But anyway, she wanted to have this party with all the, so she, she invited all the greats in Hollywood, all the stars. Hall it was gonna be Halloween, 1988. Halloween morning, October 31st, 1988 arrives. I get a call in the morning, it's from Joanne. She said, Larry, I've changed my mind. You can come to my party, but you have to come in costume. Okay, I should have known. I've been invited to parties at the last minute, right? It means there's an empty place, right? So I go to the costume store. It's totally empty. There's, what is it? Nothing left in the rack. There's literally one costume, the executioner. So I got the executioner with the black hood, you know, and the leather gloves and plastic hatchet. My wife wears the, wears, wears the nice gown and a mask. And we go to the party, we're coming up with the party on the driveway. And there are all these paparazzi there, like 20 or 30 of them, expecting every great star in Hollywood. They were invited, but they're not there because if they show up, uh, uh, Johnny Carson won't have them on the, John, on the Tonight Show. So they're not there. And they think I'm a star. So, so they're all running around me, trying to get me to take off a mask. I want to do it. I go in. It's kind of a pathetic party. People Magazine is there to do a story, the photographer and reporter, but they're not going to do it because there's nobody at the party. Uh -huh. At midnight, uh, they were take, you're supposed to take off your mask. And I, we had to leave because I couldn't take off my mask. Shortly after midnight, Joanne comes out of the kitchen, yet screaming that someone had gone into Truman's rooms. They'd stolen his ashes. They'd stolen the manuscript. To answer prayers, which somehow had, had reappeared from, 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 the, from the locker somewhere and sewn her jewelry. And people said, Who was the thief? It had to be the, it had to be the executioner, the executioner who sneakily sneaked out right before midnight. So, next, so next, so, so there, then there was the story in, in, uh, in People magazine uh, that she wanted. But she called me a few days later, hysterical again, that, that the thief had returned the ashes. Okay, meaning she'd put them back there, right? And I said, I'll come over and help you. So I came over to her house and she was, do you know what to do with the ashes? So we got in her sports car, I have the ashes in my lap and we're talking to Truman, like the three of us are having a conversation. Truman, what should we do with you? What should we do with you? So finally we decided to go to Westwood Memorial Chapel in Westwood, I suggested. We went there, that's where Marilyn Monroe's ashes are. And we, we went to different places that weren't good enough. And then we came to these marble crypts and there's Marilyn Monroe. And she said, this is, this is perfect for Truman. And the magician said, I'm sorry, Mrs. Carson, but there are only 36 of those and they're all full, but the Kennedys have not, not paid for Mr. Peter Lawford. We'll be willing to take Mr. Peter Lawford out of there and put Mr. Capote in there and we'll give you a special price. She got the special price. She went home. She couldn't stand apart with her half the ashes. She poured half of them out into this into this Japanese box, put kept a quarter, put 100% of her dog's ashes in there, took them took them back, put them in there. It, it, it's a, it, it's 100% of the dog and 25% of Truman, and it says Truman Capote. When she died, her ashes were put there too. And when her and when her effects were auctioned off. Here was this box with 25% of Truman's ashes sitting there. And they tried to, and the auction house didn't know what to do. And, they, and it, was, it, was it okay to, was, was it I'm seeing me to auction off his ashes? And then they remembered that uh, Napoleon's penis 
have been auctioned off for seven thousand dollars. They thought, well, if they can auction off Truman's penis, to auction off Napoleon's penis, we can auction off uh, uh, Truman's ashes. So that, so that they thought it'd get the same price, but it got about fifty thousand dollars. Wow. And, and I, said, I said in the book, Truman would, have been, Truman would have loved this story. He would have made so much out of this. He wouldn't have been upset. He would have considered incredibly amusing. Yeah, that would have been a great story to tell at a dinner. Well, you know, it's funny. I don't mean this in a demeaning way, but I always thought you and your wife would have been like the Rosencrantz and Guildenstern of this book. But it appears that you were actually, tell me how you got involved and how you knew these people. Well, different ways. I knew I knew Joanne because I was writing a book about Johnny Carson. Right. And, and you know, when you do these kind of books, I do, you, you're always on the, you're not never in the center of these things. No. You're always on the edge of them. You, and you, and you, just, you, you know these people, not as close friends, but you know them. And that's how I knew Dominic Dunn. And Do, Dominic was the same way. I mean, Dominic Dunn had a lot of integrity. He was going to write the truth, whatever it was. Yeah. And, um, and I remember him mostly because of the tragedy that was the center of his life and how he wrote about right. that. Right. Well, so, oh, what draws you to writing books about celebrity? It's not celebrity. I mean, I've written 18 books. I've written, I worked in a coal mine in West Virginia. I wrote a book, The Price of Justice, about two Pittsburgh lawyers and their, right. and their struggle for justice. I wrote about the lynching, about the last lynching in America, Michael Donalds. I wrote a book about Willie Unsel, the great mountain climber and his tragic life. I, I, I want to write about people who, are, who are, have intriguing, passionate lives. If the celebrities, it'll probably sell more, but uh, that's not what I'm looking at. I'm looking for a good story. Yeah, it's like Arnold Schwarzenegger. I mean, you wrote it before so many chapters of his life, too. Yes, I did. Yeah, it was almost prescient because, yes, he was a person that's important. Do you think that, do you think that Truman's legacy past our generation will continue because of his work or in addition to his personality? I hope he's remembered for the greatness of his work. It, it, it was a tragic loss. He could have done so much more. But it is it. He wrote two, two, two immortal books. In Europe, if you wrote one immortal book, that's all you have to do to be, to, be, uh, to be appreciated your entire life. Not in America. It's what you do for me yesterday. Exactly. Well, with that, Lars, thanks so much for joining us today. This was a wonderful talk. The book was wonderful. And it's on the front uh, table of our bookstore. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure.